Okay, welcome to the regular meeting of council via Zoom, January the 12th, 2021 at 4.40 p.m. Meeting call to order and we'll have a moment of silence. And uh, please remember in your moment of silence to the council extends uh, the condolences to the recent uh, death of uh, an 80 year old male due to COVID complications. Uh, our condolences to the family and friends. We have a motion to approve the agenda approved by Stacy White, Councillor White, and Councillor Owens. All in favor? Oh, I just got oh. Sorry. Be it resolved that the agenda for the regular meeting of council held on January 12th, 2021, beginning at 4.40 p.m. be approved as circulated to all members of council. Uh, in, all in favor? Motion approved. Motion carried. Uh, any declaration of uh, pecuniary interest? None noted. Petitions and delegations? None noted. Acceptance <laughs> of minutes and recommendations. Do you want to read the motion? I'll just ask for a mover and a second. Uh, can I have a mover? Councillor Adams, seconded by Councillor Owen. Be it resolved that council approve the minutes of the following meetings, minutes of the emergency meeting of council held December 14th, 2020, minutes of the regular meeting of council held December 15th, 2020, and minutes of the emergency meeting of council held December, December 17th, 2020. All in favor? Motion carried. Uh, reports of municipal officers and communications, item 6.1. A verbal report on COVID-19 update. Ms. Sackrider. Good afternoon. In response to today's sobering announcement from Premier Ford, we are reiterating the importance of following all public health recommendations and restrictions. This afternoon's declaration of a provincial emergency, coupled with the stay-at-home order effective tomorrow at midnight, will help stop the spread of COVID-19 by reducing concerning levels of mobility as the province ramps up its vaccine rollout. It will take all residents to follow the updated strict workplace safety measures, along with the public health guidelines to defeat the virus. In order to ensure all departments are following the restrictions, the senior management team will meet tomorrow to confirm our operational plan for the duration of the stay at home order to ensure the continuity of essential services that the corporation provides. We do remind everyone that for the duration of the order, we all need to reduce the number of daily contacts we have outside our immediate household by staying at home except for essential purposes, such as going to the grocery store, accessing health services for exercise or for essential work. All businesses must ensure that any employee who can work from home does work from home. Face coverings continue to be required in the indoor areas of essential businesses that remain open and are recommended outdoors when physical distancing of two meters is not possible. New enforcement measures mean that tickets can be issued for those not complying with the stay at home order. At this point, I will pass it over to Ms. Schumacher, Administrator at Tech Pioneer Residence followed by Mr. Gorman, Director of Corporate Services. Thank you, Ms. Sackrider. So your worship through you to council. This is the verbal COVID update for Tech Pioneer residents. Um, as many of you know, uh, Tech Pioneer residents did declare a COVID-19 outbreak as of December 18th, following the positive swab during weekly surveillance swabbing of our staff. Um, since that initial staff case, there have been two more positive staff cases um, identified on December 25th and January 5th. All of those staff members 
um, are doing well. The two resolved cases um, have returned to work and the third remains home on isolation. This home has followed all public health and Ministry of Health and Long-Term Care guidelines protocols since the pandemic was declared last spring. Since the out outbreak was declared, the home has maintained this increased vigilance on infection control practices as, and has continued with the following items. Um, weekly staff swabbing for surveillance testing. Staff can only work in one long-term care home. All staff must wear face protection at all times while at, on duty, except for the times they are eating. On December 26th, we did add the addition of um, eye protection for all staff. So goggles, face shields, or safety glasses have been provided for all staff. We continue to cohort staff, which means they only work on one of the nursing units. We continue to cohort our residents, which means they must stay on their own unit. And during the outbreak, they must stay in their own rooms as quarantine whenever possible with the exception of those that are at risk for choking during mealtimes. Group activity programs have been stopped since the outbreak on December 18th, and we continue with one-to-one -one activity programs as possible. We are doing daily hand hygiene and personal protective equipment donning and doffing audits. We have recently increased our environmental audits from monthly to weekly and now daily if possible. We have increased housekeeping to high touch areas. All residents continue to eat in the rooms, except for those, like I mentioned before, who are at risk for choking. We have increased our nursing staff, both registered and PSW, to ensure that we're providing the care required for all residents. All residents are screened and assessed at least twice a day for their vital signs and temperatures and to observe for any symptoms. All residents are swabbed anytime there is a staff case identified. We remain closed to visitors and are only allowing those essential visitors for palliative care or essential caregivers on a case-by-case -case basis. We're not allowing anything to come into the home, so no deliveries of um, special food for the residents that their family members may bring in just to prevent anything coming into the home. We are awaiting more information from public health regarding vaccine. Um, I think that's it. <laughs> it's quite the list, but uh, we, we've been very busy and I want to just publicly thank the staff for all of their hard work and their continued vigilance in keeping the residents safe. Thank you. I'll pass you along to Mr. Gorman. Thank you, Ms. Schumacher, your worship through you to council. I'd like to take a few minutes just to update everybody on the progress of some of the funding applications we've submitted recently. So in late October, the town submitted phase two funding applications, which we were notified we were unsuccessful in our application. Uh, not overly surprising, given the small shortfall we were projecting and the fact that these funds were intended for municipalities who faced extreme hardship during the pandemic. The town was very fortunate as it was able to appropriate plan for a fair portion of the anticipated losses as we were still budgeting when the COVID outbreak began. On December 16th, the province did announce that it was investing another 695 million to help municipalities manage financial impacts of COVID and to start 2021 in a more secure position. So the town of Kirkland Lake was allocated $47,000 Allocations for this were based on a combination of households within the municipality and a proportion of COVID-19 cases, which were occurring in our local district. At the time of this calculation, we would have had minimal of these instances as this was prior to the escalating levels we've observed over the recent late December and into January. Uh, lastly, the pandemic has really identified and highlighted how dated we are in our technology and how challenging it would be to basically utilize a remote work strategy for many of our staff. Uh, given this, the town did submit an application to Neonet in hopes to establish mobile workstations. Uh, we did receive notification we were successful and Neonet is going to fund the purchase of five laptops to the tune of 
Thank you. Thank you. That completes the COVID update report. Uh, we have a motion to accept that uh, report verbal. Councillor Ivanov. Oh, Councillor White, did you have any questions? I'm sorry. No, okay. Uh, second the motion by Councillor White. Uh, sorry, uh, 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 Your Worship, I do have a question. I have my hand raised. Can you guys see my hand up? I messed up the uh, lad. Sorry. Okay. Uh, my, my question is to, uh, I hope you guys can hear me. Uh, my question is to Ms. Schumacher. Um, I just want to know, do you have PSW or uh, PN or RN people that are maybe uh, part-time staff that are also uh, working in, let's say, a standing care or any other um, uh, old age home? Do you have any? Because that might be an issue if you have people that are moving from employer to employer or workplace to workplace. Do you have any at uh, the TPR? Thank you. Uh, Councillor Shaba, we are not permitted to allow staff to work in two homes. So currently we do not have anybody that is working in two nursing homes. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay, motion uh, by Councillor Ivanov and seconded by Councillor White. All in favor? Oh, I'm sorry, read the motion, please. Be it resolved that the verbal COVID-19 update be res received. All in favor? Motion carried. Item 6.2, proposed timber harvesting. Uh, Mr. Wilfred Haas, Director for Economic Development. Thank you. Through you, you worship. Uh, the issue in question is timber harvesting on municipal land. Background in 2012, the municipality prepared a land management agreement. It identified forest values on municipally owned land and established guidelines for their management, including timber harvesting. Uh, we did co conduct a successful cut in 2018-2019. Oh, I'm sorry, I'm having problems with the uh, camera here. I keep hitting the button, but it doesn't come on. You're on. Okay, it's on now. Let's hope it stays. Uh, yes, we did a successful cut in 2018-2019. Now, we have two areas in which interest was expressed by forestry companies. One is by the landfill. It's a small area of a mature stand of uh, jack pine. The other is north of the Blanche River. It's much larger and is of mixed timber. The recommendation from staff is that we do hold public consultations on the proposed areas and report that back to council. Pending council's decision, we would prepare an RFP and go through the same process as we did before. Uh, through the land management agreement, we did hold public consultations. These areas had been uh, identified and discussed. However, I would recommend that we do that again, simply because uh, one of the areas north of the Blanche River has, um, it has a lot of interest from the people living in Swastika and elsewhere. So I think it's better that we uh, find out what the public thinks and we can accommodate that within the RFP. The cut themselves would probably, it, it, should it go ahead, uh, would recommend that it be done by 2023. Uh, payment again would be like a lump sum, one or two contractors or areas could be cut together or separate. And uh, silver culture, that's the replanting, uh, that would be included in the contract. And I can stop and just take questions then. Councillor Owen. He's muted. How about now? Yeah. Okay. If I remember correctly, um, in reading about the one uh, close to the Plants River, access, and, and correct me if I'm wrong, um, to that, one of the accesses would have been through, would be through Swastika. It is, did I read that right, uh, Mr. Hollis? It, it, Yes, it is possible. Okay, because I have real concerns about um, one, 
I think heavy trucks would have a hard time, depending which way they're coming from, negotiating the streets. Um, I have a hard time with heavy trucks on those streets, which are already deteriorated. And my concern would be that we'd be making short term gain at long term pain because we, with the heavy transports, uh, we'd be tearing up the road, not to mention uh, if I was living in a residential section of town, and I do deal with this a little bit because of the hydro trucks, but they're not logging trucks. Uh, I wouldn't want logging trucks coming through my neighborhood. So that's, that's a concern I have there. If, if we decided to go ahead, I, I think it said there was a second way it could be accessed, but it was longer. Yes, uh, on to the first question. Um, it would be incumbent upon the proponents to explain how they would be getting the wood out. It would not necessarily be the large uh, lumber trucks that we're accustomed to. Okay. It would be something we would put on them. Also, uh, within the RF, uh, RFP would state that any damages they've uh, caused, they would be responsible for, because we're not a logging, uh, it's not a logging road. In terms of other equipment, uh, there has been heavy equipment going in and out of there. Uh, they did uh, quite a bit of exploration up there in the past few years. I haven't had a chance to go up there recently, but um, that's something that we'd be looking at as well to, to see, okay, if you're going in, what will you be, what kind of impact will you specifically have both on the paved as well as the unpaved section and going in. To the second question, yes, there is potentially another uh, entry point from the north. Um, that does not exist. It would have to be punched in and would be done probably as part of the uh, TFA, um, Timiskaming Forestry Alliance harvesting operations. It would be a longer uh, haul to get in and would probably be reflected in the revenues. That's for, uh, I, I would assume as well. Um, it, pro, uh, no, I said it, it would probably take uh, some extra time to be uh, co uh, included with other work, road work that's being done in that area. Okay, thank you. I just wanted to bring up my concerns and I'm sure that um, that they can be addressed in the, in the uh, contract, but I think it's super important that we consult with the residents out there because I certainly wouldn't want that kind of traffic. Uh, I got two, two young grandchildren living with me right now and I certainly wouldn't want that kind of traffic on my residential street. So, thank you. Okay. Uh, Your Worship, I have a couple of, uh, uh, I have a, one question and one clarification. Um, the first one, the clarification would be, I don't have a page number to this, but the second page, on top of the page, the paragraph reads, the revenue uh, generated from spring 2020, that will be in the amount of $35,000. That revenue was generated from the cuts and was directed to support the community improvement plan. So I'm not too sure what are they. What is as such as what? I, I you know I'm not. There's nothing very specific about what that what that what that what that means. And okay. number two, uh, my question is: I couldn't find uh, anywhere in your report. Maybe you could direct me to to it. Whereby when all these trees are harvested. So is it uh, incumbent upon the uh, uh, the contractor to make whole of that area? Who's who's in charge of making sure that uh, 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 new trees are replanted? Okay, would it be your first, down sorry. or would it be a contractor? Sorry, yeah, go ahead, that's it. Okay, sorry, as to your first question, when, uh, there were two cuts that were done. One was a larger one when it was completed. Uh, a request to come forward both from the, uh, uh, sorry, from the um, snowmobile club, identifying a second area and that area was added to the cut. The report was brought back to council. It, it's uh, at the later part, I don't want to uh, refer to it right now, but um, we advised council what revenues had been generated, what was coming forward. And Councillor Adams at that point had recommended that the dollars uh, realized from the harvesting activities be used to uh, for to offset costs incurred under the community improvement plan. Uh, there are no specific costs allocated. There are two points to this. No specific costs allocated under the community improvement plan because it depends on what the applications are that come in. 
could be a facade improvement, could be a building renovation, could be uh, uh, efficiencies, it could be a tax uh, deferral. But it go, uh, Councillor Adams' recommendation was that it, the money recognized from the harvest would be put towards offsetting the costs absorbed by the town through the community improvement plan. It was a recommendation. It did not result in uh, the establishment of a specific reserve. So the money's in suspense. That's something that I think we would probably want to bring back to council and establish how that uh, be, is handled in the future. Uh, second part to your question was regarding actually silviculture and replanting. As part of the contract, the proponents are 100% responsible for replanting that area. They, uh, in the last contract, we took a, a, we demanded a bond, a performance bond, and we're holding on to that until such a time as the work is done, at which point we will release it. Done to our satisfaction and the MNR satisfaction. Thank you. Councillor Adams. Yep, uh, thank you very much, Wilf. I'm in uh, full support of the motion being presented today to hold public consultations and look forward to report back to council. Thank you. Thank you. We have a motion to accept that report. Motion uh, council, moved by Councillor Casey Owens, seconded by Councillor Shabba. Be it resolved that report number 2021-DEV-002 entitled Proposed Timber Harvesting be received and that staff be directed to hold public consultations on the proposed harvesting of timber on municipally owned lands identified as site one and site two in this report and report back to council with the results. All in favor? Motion carried. Item 6.3, land use permit uh, with the Ontario Federation of Snowmobile Clubs. Uh, Ms. McNaughton. Thank you, Your Worship. Uh, through you to council, uh, we were approached by the local snowmobile club to enter into a land use permit to go over the five mining claims south of Armour Lake. Um, this was brought forward at a previous council meeting back in February. Um, when ECOM was approached as well, this was what Wilf had just mentioned that um, the cut was expanded to allow the snowmobile club to conduct some work on the land to expand their trail um, so that they can tie their south and north trails together. So at this time, they are just asking if we can enter into a land use agreement or land use permit. And we also added an additional agreement just for the municipality's purposes for our own um, security and liability reasons. Any questions from council or concerns? Then noted. We have a motion uh, to be presented. Councillor Ivanov and Councillor White. Be it resolved that report number 2021-DEV-001 entitled Land Use Permit with Ontario Federation of Snowmobile Clubs be received. That council authorized the town of Kirkland Lake to execute a land use permit with the Ontario Federation of Snowmobile, Snowmobile Clubs Golden Corridor Snowdrifters over five mining claims south of Armour Lake. And that staff be directed to present a bylaw to council to enter into an identity and hold harmless agreement with the Ontario Federation of Snowmobile Clubs Golden Corridor Snowdrifters to utilize municipal land for the purpose of snowmobile trails. All in favor? Motion carried. Item 6.4, Strategic Initiatives Update. Mr. Gorman. Thank you, Your Worship, through you to Council. Uh, I think similar to most everyone's general sentiments on 2020, staff are looking forward to closing out the past year and are optimistic to embark on to 2021 with the expectation of growing and progressing the organization. As Council is aware, we previously put forward a strategic plan, which was approved mid-year in 2020. 
It aligned our goals and objectives for the course of four years. Staff have previously updated council on progress towards these objectives in Q3, and we'll provide an update with, at your end with our regular set of quarterly reports to council anticipated in Q, for Q4 in February of 2021. This past December, WSCS presented its findings from its service delivery review. The list of recommendations put forth was quite comprehensive. At the time, the motion essentially read that they were to be included in the Town of Kirkland Lake strategic plan for 2021 and that an implementation plan be prepared as part of our 2021 work plan. Senior staff are continuing to assess the implications of this service delivery review and its findings. One key aspect that hasn't really been touched on so far between the presentation and the existing motion is the relationship of this document to that of our strategic plan. The nature of the recommendations put forward within the WSCS reports largely align with existing objectives identified in our strategic review, our strategic plan, and can likely serve as steps and actions which should be taken to progress towards our overarching values that we've identified in the plan. There are several instances we've noted where it will likely create several new strategic priorities. I think a, a key thing to hone in on here is, you know, at a minimum, the service delivery re review really emphasized and illustrated a lot of challenges that staff are likely to face in trying to achieve our strategic objectives. Um, you know, it really should set the tone as we progress, as it clearly indicates that there's some groundwork that is needed to be revisited and prioritized. So for instance, in the challenges we talked about with reporting, those will play into things like asset management planning, a lack of detailed costs and historical problems in ledgers. And so we, we do appreciate uh, patience as we work through those objectives. And so the purpose of tonight is just to sort of update you guys on our next steps, uh, sort of give you some comfort as to where we're going with this. Essentially, our next steps are to assess the strategic priorities as at the year end. Uh, from there, we're gonna review our findings and recommendations from the WSCS service delivery review. We'll align them with the appropriate objectives within the strategic plan and where required, we'll identify and create new action items to bring forward. Along with those recommendations, we recognize that we will likely have to reprioritize some of these strategic items and then identify some key components and seek approval on direction. Um, Going forward, we're looking to maybe come up with a mechanism to routinely review and reprioritize these based on the evolving operational needs and ongoing developments. We think this will likely be triggered through the end of year and mid-year progress reports. At this time, I'd like to open it up to any questions any may, anybody may have. Uh, uh, Councillor White. So we definitely do appreciate what a daunting task this is um, going through the reports. Um, it just really brought in um, how much work we have to, uh, you have to do definitely. I was just wondering, there wasn't a timeline given, do you have a projected date or, or month that we can look forward to, to having this back to us? Councillor White, uh, yes. So right now we're sitting down internally. Uh, the expectation was to meet as a group It'll likely be through Zoom. Uh, hopefully we can align it with our Q4 reporting and sort of reprioritize. We are still working with WSCS to get the final reporting and to work through those recommendations. So we have seen several of them come through where they've provided more detailed action plans along with timelines. And from there, what we're essentially gonna do is we're gonna look at the recommendations and sort of see which ones we believe have the most merit and the timing and then try to align them as part of the budget process as well. So a lot of groundwork really, will really be put forward in this first quarter. Just a comment, uh, Mr. Gorman, I, I, I appreciate this is, you know, it, it is a daunting task as uh, Councillor White mentioned, but uh, working from one strategic uh, plan uh, with a combined uh, st strategic plan and, and uh, uh, operations review or service review, I should say, uh, will certainly make it a lot clearer and easier for both staff and council to understand uh, where we're at, setting priorities and, and be able to get uh, updates uh, as, as to uh, the progress that we're making. So uh, 
it's, it's a work in progress, but it certainly, I think, will will be a much uh, easier to follow. So we thank you and staff for work going to be putting this together, I understand. Yeah, uh, yes, I do, uh, Your Worship. Um, uh, Mr. Gorman, um, I've read the strategic plan. Uh, thank you for the update. But I, I know it is one of those things, uh, kind of a living document, uh, as, the, as the mayor has said, you know, is, is work in progress. So for uh, a new guy like me, can you really highlight maybe three of those initiatives that were identified that at least we're moving along, say close to maybe 90%, 80%? Because I read what you have here, uh, but again, I think maybe we should highlight some of the ones that that were doable or that we at least try that we're working on and the others that are still left to be done. So what are some of the, the critical ones? I mean, the highlights, uh, one or two, maybe three that you can at least uh, let me know because I'm new to, at this table that uh, we've done. I know you have service. There is uh, this thing about service delivery also, but can you, can you take me through that? If you can. Yes, sure, Councillor Shaba. Um, not to delve too much into the details, but it has been a, a busy year for us. Uh, if we want to sort of talk to some of the highlights that we've done, a lot of it has been around policy development. So one of the things that we did aim to do was bring policies forward to essentially every council meeting and uh, save and except for maybe one or two over the course of the year, uh, we did such that. Uh, we looked towards communications. Uh, we launched a new website and a communications policy that we brought forward. Uh, we took a lot of steps across different areas as well. So we did start to embark on the contractor assessment. So we started to look at contractor services versus in-house uh, to help formulate the stuff that we're being putting forward in the budget. So each uh, area was basically tasked with that responsibility. And so as we, we tendered out documents, we basically did assessments as to could we do it in-house cheaper or through contractors. Uh, there, there's a whole host of them that we did, like I said, achieve and some we didn't quite achieve to the extent that we wanted to. And, you know, in recognizing that we sort of looked at, sort of looked at this, uh, I was a very encompassing document uh, as you can see, there's a lot of volume. Yeah, yeah. And really some of them we strategically actually pushed out so we could recognize as we were working through that they would feed well into one another. So some of them, for instance, like um, training, we implemented a training policy. We implemented it into a fourth quarter training regime uh, and then what we'll do is we're basically going to blend it into the budget process going forward where we identify those needs across the group. So in some instances, it may still show as in progress and likely be closed out quick into 2021. Okay, thank you. No problem. Thank you, sir. Yes, thank you, Mr. Gorman, for that update. Uh, you're quite correct. We have made uh, some progress in several areas. I think I highlighted that in our uh, review of 2020. Uh, do we have any other concerns, questions from council? We have a motion to accept uh, Mr. Gorman's report. Uh, Mr. Owen, Councillor Owen, and Councillor Adams. Be it resolved that memorandum number 2020-CORP-002M entitled Strategic Initiatives Update be received and that staff be directed to present for consideration an updated listing of strategic priorities encompassing deliverables from recent service delivery reviews, the strategic plan, and other priorities and initiatives identified. All in favor? Motion carried. Item 6.5, Financial Policy Framework. Again, Mr. Gorman. Thank you, Your Worship. Uh, through you to Council. This was essentially development of policies is one of the key roles and responsibilities of Council. Uh, what I'm putting forward here tonight is essentially framework that we think will help ensure that our vision for key financial policies and processes are aligned with the direction that's desired by Council prior to bringing those detailed policies uh, forth for approval. So as you work your way through your document, you'll see some key items such as reserves and reserve fund management, uh, which can be quite comprehensive. And we just wanna make sure we're going down that path as to where you would like to go before we put forward a detailed policy. 
Uh, the framework here is going to essentially shape a lot of our processes throughout the year and help ensure that our efforts are aligned with what you guys would intend us to do. And it should give staff better direction as we work through various scenarios. Uh, the list is intended to capture key financial planning related items. So it won't be all inclusive of every sort of policy around financial. But if there's anything else that you'd like to sort of see here, you know, we can certainly add it as required. But the intent uh, behind this framework is essentially to recognize that these things really work all as an all-encompassing strategy. And because that to make sure those objectives that are behind each of the individual ones really align with the intent of what you guys are trying to achieve. So at this time, I'd welcome any questions or if you have any further things that you'd like to see included within, uh, please bring it forward. And then if nothing, what we'll do is we'll start to bring some detailed policies over the course of the next yeah. quarter as well. Councillor White. Yeah, this is just amazing, uh, Keith. Like everything that the community has asked for, everything that we've been asking for, you've hit the nail on the head. I've got like stars everywhere on this report. Just an amazing job uh, for you and your team. I do have a question about um, the non-recurring revenues being financed by, uh, sorry, non-recurring items being financed by non-recurring <laughs> revenues. So does that mean like donation? So if, that, if somebody was to give a donation to like the museum or the, the library that just like here's some money, not here's some money specifically for books or a new rug or whatever it is, is that the kind of thing that you're talking about so that those departments can get donations and those people won't see that donation being used for a utility bill. Instead, it would be something, a, a one-time item that they may not get because of budget constraints. Um, so just to speak a little bit to that, wasn't thinking down to that singular level of donations per se, but I'm more thinking of like the modernization monies that we received previously in 2019. Uh, so part of the challenges with that is you get a big pot of money and, and we start to use that funding and we may have funded salaries and stuff that would have been on the payroll regardless. And then at that time, what we do is we sort of maybe miss some opportunities to actually progress the organization. And so we just want to be mindful when things like that happen, that we, we put them towards things that will truly benefit the organization and not pay our day to day, right? Um, that's sort of the mindset behind it. So modernization monies was one example, uh, building sales or that kind of thing. So we have Heritage North on the block right now, and we don't know. Uh, so that would be non-recurring revenue. And we wouldn't want to basically assume that those funds would come in and start to spend them to fund our routine operations. Because the second we start to use those things, we'll be dependent on them. And if they don't come forward, well, then it adjusts your tax levy requirements at the end of the day. So it's just uh, to really recognize those one-time cash flow things coming in. Uh, take your insurance proceeds. That's another great example previously. So it was a, a sort of a windfall, if you will. I wasn't anticipated. And I believe the strategy was to pay down debt rather than fund recurring operations and that kind of thing. Oh, Councilor Rowan. Yeah, I'm just gonna make some general comments here. Um, Keith, I don't know where you find all the time to do all this work. It's, uh, it's amazing. And when a non-financial guy like me can read what you're doing and, and truly understand it, it means you've done your job exceedingly well. Um, having said that, I see a lot of things in there that I like in terms of reserves and reserve funds, in terms of planning for not just this year, but two more years down the road. Um, as you know, I sat at council for years and years, uh, reporting on council, and every budget I saw, um, was based on meeting next year's costs. And there was never any thought giving, given to what's gonna happen in two years or three years down the road. And, you know, I think it's important and I think that you've introduced uh, a sound way of planning for the ratepayers of Kirkland Lake, uh, a, a way that will hopefully bring a lot more stability um, and a lot less of uh, panic in terms of even for the counselors. I mean, uh, it's panic city when we find out that 
you know, we get a budget presentation and you're going to have to raise the taxes 10% or whatever, it's panic city. This way, you know, planning more than one year or taking more than one year into account is, uh, is just amazing. And I, again, I want to thank you for that work and writing it in such a simple way that I could understand. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Owen. Uh, in regards to that, I have a great team that keeps the wheel going here every day to allow me to step back and sort of think about this. And a lot of what you're seeing here are ideas that were put forward previously by Ms. Matthews. And it's just basically trying to formalize these types of things. So I think uh, Ms. Matthews really stressed the importance of reserves. I think she's talked to these guys about having stabilization reserves in the past. Mm -hmm. And it's just now with the, the resources we have in hand, we can start to take those steps forward to really try to progress it a little bit more. So but I do appreciate that. And so the team is, is hard at work making sure everything flows every day to allow for this kind of thing. So I echo the same uh, compliment, uh, Mr. Gorman, in regards to this report, very thorough and well planned out, uh, especially hit the nail on the head about reserves. We've been talking about it. Previous council's been talking about it. Nothing ever got done. Uh, so to put a, a plan in place where we're doing this every year and uh, committing to it is going to make a huge difference, such as uh, what Councillor Rowan was saying as well. So uh, thank you for doing such a, a concise, uh, elaborate report and, and uh, uh, a great plan I had. This, uh, this isn't the hard part going to actually be funding those reserves and determining which ones are highest priorities. But uh, like I said, it'll be a lot of work, but we'll work towards it as a group. Well, nobody said it'd be easy. You're right. Any um, other yes, I do want, yeah, Mr. Uh, Mr. Uh, Gorman, uh, what is the status of the reserve fund as we speak? Um, I'd have to actually go back and look. So right now we're just closing out 2020. Uh, it probably will be a week, a couple of weeks to sort of have a preliminary estimate as to where we will be with year end. So it's still fairly early in the year to be closed out. Um, but what we'll do is we'll be working with Sherry and Peter and the team to close out and ensure all of our obligations are, are properly booked to assess those reserve funds. So we don't, you don't have a running total of the depletion or maybe contribution to it? Uh, we do, it'd be in our VATM system. But we'll want to make sure that everything is booked and before we put forward numbers on those balances, for sure. Uh, my second one is, uh, I'm, I'm not too much aware of the policy part of, uh, as to how uh, the council could tap into the reserve. What triggers, uh, is there any policy position or anywhere I can read that as to what triggers us going into the reserve? I, I know what debt be one of those things, you know, but... Nevertheless, what are the other ancillary factors that would trigger assessing the depleting the reserve? To so your typically, knowledge. Oh, sorry. Uh, typically, the reserves are, are largely done through the budget process, if you will. That's where most of the direction towards those types of things happen. Uh, so what will happen, you'll, you'll see it shortly when we get together to start talking Q1 um, or 2021. Uh, basically, what will happen is we'll try to figure out sources of funding. And then we'll look to see which reserves are in place and which ones can fund various needs for the municipality. And then at that time, we'll recommend those things be funded as such. So for instance, um, capital. We may have water infrastructure or that kind of thing that we would look to fund out of the water works or wastewater reserve funds. And then at that point, we'd put that forward and we'd basically give you a budget recommendation. Uh, council would deliberate that and then vote and approve the source of funding to come from said reserve. And then the other time that we really do see movement is uh, we were just talking about the CIP program. So for instance, we may have revenues that come in, uh, council could direct us to allocate those funds to a reserve or establish those reserves. And so, so it's largely driven by council decision, uh, largely within the budget process. And then there are one-offs throughout the year there where they would dictate and tell us to take money or draw from. So if we had an unforeseen circumstance, we would come forward and we'd say, we don't know how to fund this. Uh, here's some options. And we would basically put forward the recommendation to draw from a reserve before doing so. 
So any any emergency situation will not necessarily trigger depletion of the uh, reserve fund, right? Not necessarily. And so, okay. so what will end up happening, like all encompassing, it's uh, an emergency. We have we have clauses within our procurement for emergencies that would allow for purchase. And then what we basically do is we sort of finalize our year end. Um, and then at that point, we might fund those emergencies through other short savings that we've noted in other areas, or we may have to draw upon the reserves to, to do that afterwards. Okay, thank you. Thank you for that report, uh, Mr. Gorman. Uh, we have a motion. Councillor White, seconded by Councillor Ivanov. Be it resolved that memorandum number 2021-corp-001M entitled Financial Policies Framework be received and that staff be directed to present for consideration detailed, detailed financial policies in Q1 2021 for reserve slash reserve fund management, operating surplus slash deficit and budget slash financial controls. All in favor? Motion carried. Item 6.6, .6, uh, 2021 budget preparation, Mr. Berman. Thank you, Worship, to you to council. And so similar to the financial policies framework that was previously presented, uh, we're essentially trying to ensure that the delivery of our 2021 budget and the related steps and processes that we're sort of proposing align well with your direction and vision. And so uh, basically we've sort of tabled how we intend to, to work through the process. Uh, it does encompass some of the ideas and deliverables identified within the strategic plan, uh, largely with the emphasis on improved communications and public engagement. Um, in addition, one of the things that we are looking for is some preliminary guidelines to help shape how we work through this budget and sort of set our tone before we get really going deep into it. Uh, save and accept for any growth that may be realized in 2020, we're essentially targeting to do a baseline budget at comparable levels to that of 2020. Uh, from there, what we're going to essentially do is identify any new initiatives that have been proposed, and then we'll have appropriate costs allocated to them, and then the ongoing impact of those programs uh, to allow for appropriate review, and then we can sort of to gauge if it's something that we want to proceed with. So essentially status quo right now, we would propose new services or new initiatives, and then from there we'll, we'll seek approval. Uh, one thing that we are looking to do is take our capital and look more broad and in a longer term scope. And this does play well into that reserves and reserve fund management sort of thing. And so what we wanna do is we wanna alleviate, uh, if you will, high and low points with the tax levy. So we would wanna do is sort of get a feel for the next five years of capital detailed next year, like 2021, and then a four year projection. And basically try to understand longer term what our scope will be and see if we can sort of come up with a reasonable target to try to raise on an annual basis to try to avoid those peaks and valleys if at all possible. And then it'll also help us sort of uh, try to understand our strategy for funding those types of things. At this time, I welcome any questions just about it, or if there's any concerns over the timelines, um, please put them forward and we can sort of reassess. But uh, what we're trying to do is, this is one of those things that we're outside of our strategic objectives, if you will. Um, I, you know, Personally speaking, I don't think it was the year where we want to to get ahead of things, only in light of COVID and everything else. We don't want to put anybody in a position uh, where we were like municipalities that we saw last year, where budgets have essentially been passed, tar rates have, tar tax rates have been set, and then they found themselves in severe shortfalls and scrambling, if you will. So it's not that we want to drag our feet on it. We think we can do some improvement this year over timelines we realized last year. And we think we can probably come out of Q1 with a good solid plan uh, save and accept. Hopefully COVID plays well and we have a bit better understanding on the operation that it's going to have, but that will continue to provide some uncertainty for us, unfortunately. If I may add, Mr. Gorman, uh, uh, in your report, uh, you mentioned uh, that there would be opportunity for uh, public pr uh, participation and I think uh, that's very important, especially during these difficult times. Uh, that will be made available online and possibly at a, well, 
with an open uh, finance meeting, budget meeting uh, to the public as well. So that's a welcome addition that uh, hasn't always been there in the past. So uh, we appreciate that. A lot of our peer group is putting forward uh, sometimes preliminary budget surveys and then post budget surveys upon release. Uh, so what we'll do is we'll sort of target it and try it uh, this time and see how it works. Hopefully it's well received and I think timing is critical right now in light of everything going on with the pandemic. And yeah. Okay. Any uh, further comments or questions? We have a motion. Councillor uh, Owens and Councillor Ivanov. Second. Be it resolved that memorandum number 2021-CORP-003M entitled 2021 budget preparations be received, that staff prepare the 2021 operating and capital budget and capital forecast for years 2022 through 2025, and that the 2021 budget timeline and considerations identified in memo 2021-CORP-003M be used to develop the 2021 budget for council's review and approval. All in favor? Motion carried. Thank you, Councillor mm -hmm. uh, uh, Treasurer Forma. Uh, item 6.7, Police Services Board recommendations. Ms. Elliott. Thank you, Your Worship, through you to Council. The Police Service Board met on December 9th, 2020, and the agenda package for that meeting uh, was listed under your attachments for this report. Within that meeting, there were two items that had motions with recommendations to Council, one of which was with a fence request that came from a resident that had originally flown, uh, yeah, flown through um, the development services department and Ms. Billado had advised the resident that it was something um, that possibly the police service board could look into um, as from her planning standpoint she wasn't able to recommend a fence and then at the police service board discussions um, surrounded possibly the idea of increasing the lighting in the area or working towards trimming some of the trees and just making it more visible for uh, the problematic trail. So that was one of the items. And the second item that arose in conversations under additional information was to possibly recommend to council to have staff submit a letter to the MTO to review the section of Government Road West from Goldthorpe Road to Archer Drive to reduce the speed limit. So I've put uh, a recommended motion based on those recommendations for today, uh, but as Police Service Board wished that Council would discuss these two items and see what your thoughts were on that. Uh, possibly Councillor Olin and Mayor Kylie can help fill in the blanks for the conversations on the fence request as well. Councillor Olin? Yeah, um, concerning that path, I did a site visit prior to the police uh, commission or police board meeting. I think we have to be very, very careful in that instance because it's not a path. It's an uphill climb with no stairs. There's liability issues involved. Um, there is also potential to cut the liability then put in stairs. Well, there's a cost involved there. Um, then we'd have to maintain the stairs. They come off a maintained sidewalk. Um, it's not a simple issue in terms of just adding lighting. Um, it was brought up at the police board meeting where we're supposed to encourage uh, people to get out and walk. I forget the, the name of that transportation, active transportation. But in actual fact, by going up that hill, they're cutting their walk short because from what was brought up at the police board meeting, most of the people going up there are either going to uh, the grocery store or the coffee shop. Um, 
So rather than walk down to the corner, which is quite close, and then across the front where we do have maintained sidewalks, they're climbing up this hill. Um, they, the, the problem that was brought up was a problem of uh, theft and vandalism in the area. And I was quite sympathetic until a couple of weeks ago when I lost $1,200 worth of items from my shed. Um, and then I realized, you know what, this is happening all over town. Um, I don't think it's just specific to that particular street. So I think councils should, councils should go take a look for themselves. Uh, I may be exaggerating the, the uh, potential liability there, but there are no stairs and it's an uphill climb. And we also have a um, guardrail there, which if somebody fell going up that hill, they could hit their head on the guardrail. Um, so I'm not totally convinced on that one. But in terms of uh, reducing the speed, I think that's just common sense. I think it should be done. And in most communities, where you go from, you don't go from 80 kilometers an hour down to, to 50. There's usually a, a step down in between. And I think that would improve the safety of people in, in, that are walking in Chappie Hughes and it wouldn't cause traffic jams or traffic problems. I think it would improve the safety of that area. So I fully support that. But I think we need, as a council, we need to revisit the other one. Thank you. I would agree with Councillor Owen. Uh, <clears throat> that is basically a hill to climb. And in the winter, it's slippery and icy. Uh, there are liability issues. Uh, I think it, it's worth council councillors going by and just having 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 a look at it to, to get their own uh, view, rule of the, the land sort of. Uh, I'm I'm not sure what the uh, how Miss Billado arrived at the no fence. Uh, not being able to put a fence up there. Uh, and perhaps we could get a little bit uh, uh, more of an explanation from the staff. So I, I would recommend counsel counselors do a walk by and just have a look at it for yourself. But it, I would ask that maybe we direct, direct uh, staff uh, to review it and come back with their recommendations uh, as long as, as well as uh, from council have a better idea how to understand what, what the real issue is uh, if council is in agreement. Uh, Councillor Casey Holmes. Um, my only concern with this one was the first part uh, in regards to the uh, street light. There's other residents that have asked for lights in different areas of town and have been turned down for whatever reason that I, I can think of two off the top of my head right now behind the complex from the complex to Callback. Uh, there's a resident that's been asking for lighting in that parking lot for years. We've said, for whatever reason, it's still not done. Um, on downtown and laneways, we've asked before. So I think if we entertain this idea right now, it's gonna open up a can of worms where several residents are gonna be asking for the same thing in different areas of town. The, uh comment on that as well, Councillor Owens. Uh, I do have to agree with you on that lighting issue. Uh, when we looked at uh, possibly doing something behind the complex uh, uh, for, for lighting, to put up a new uh, pole, run the line out, out there, we were looking at close to $10,000. Uh, I don't think this issue warrants spending $10,000. And there are other areas like behind the complex that uh, certainly I think are ahead of uh, in priority than this location. And I also agree with uh, Councillor Owen in regards to the speed uh, limits uh, coming into the Chappie uh, uh, area that, that we have to go to MTO to look at getting that uh, changed slightly. 
Uh, Councillor Boyd, you had a I, I agree with my fellow council members on this. That's a trail. It's been there for as long as I can remember. It was there when I was a high school student. And if we're going to start lighting up trails, well, there's a series of trails through the federal bush that go from Grierson uh, over to Harding um, and Atkins and whatnot. Are we going to light those up? Um, the trail that goes between Harding and across the tracks. Are we going to light that up? I think we're really opening um, a can of worms here. Unfortunately, that is not an official route of the town of Kirkland Lake. So the idea of lighting it up, I just right at this point, I can't get behind. We'll see what staff comes back with. But at this point, I think we'd be opening a can of worms. I agree. Councilor Owen? Yeah, just to clarify something, the request for the lighting did not come from people who used the trail. It came from residents at, at uh, on uh, First Street who have have noted a number of incidents of uh, theft and um, and damage, mischief. The property in, in the recent times. One of them is a long-term resident. I think they've been there on the street for over 30 years. That's where, that's where the request came from. And I'm not in favor of, I, I would be much more in favor of putting a fence across to stop people from using it to reduce their liability, but I'm not, I don't, I'm not a legal expert. I'm not a, a planning expert. If we were to add lighting, I don't think it would do it the cheapest way to do it is there is a light uh, standard almost at the bottom of that hill. And we could put a light, there's a light going out to the road. We could put a light out back to the path, but that would not, especially with the type of lighting we use now, it doesn't spread, it goes straight down. That would not alleviate the problem that the residents are having with, uh, with theft. And, you know, I know the police will say, well, put up lights and everything else. Well, I have two lights in my driveway and I still had someone go in my shed and steal items. Um, it's a sad, sad uh, way things are now. In, in the about 40 years, once every 10 years, my property has been hit. And I don't think I'm in a high crime neighborhood. So... Uh, I think it's uh, it's a sign of the times. Um, I think there's a, a lot of addiction problems. And um, some of these people are, are looking for items that they can sell off quickly and, and, and get cash. And that's a much bigger issue than council can deal with. Thank you. Can... Uh... Council agree on uh, directing staff to come back with uh, some recommendations and some, I think really we need additional information as you mentioned, Councillor Owen, to get a, get a feel for the, the lay of the land over there and what uh, meets, what would be best suited. So. We have a motion from uh, Councillor Owen and Councillor Wait a second. Be it resolved that memorandum number 2021, sorry, 2021 CLK 001M entitled Police Service Board Recommendations be received. That Council of the Corporation of the Town of Kirkland Lake adopts the recommendations to Council from the Police Service Board meeting held December 9, 2020. That staff be directed to review the trail from First Street to Station Road and report back to Council with recommendations of how to address the resident concern of increased theft in the area by utilizing the trail. And that staff be directed to send a letter to MTO to review the section of Government Road West from Goldthorpe Road to Archer Drive to reduce the speed limit. Any further comments? None noted. All in favor? Motion carried. Item 6.8, website accessibility. Thank you, Your Worship. Through you to Council, 
I just wanted to touch base with Council today to uh, remind you that as of 2021, there are new requirements for accessibility, which also include uh, what you have on your websites. Um, so with the launch of our new website, majority of those requirements are met through that provider, but where we run into some problems is with uh, documents that we upload in PDF form, so like bylaws, minutes, other things like that. So we are utilizing our communications coordinator to ensure that those accessibility checks are done on those documents before they're uploaded. Also, the other aspect is for um, videos. So in particular, our council meetings. So for live streaming, it does not need to have the closed captioning at this time. It will in future years, but it does say that any of our saved recordings do have to have that captioning. So YouTube's platform is where our videos are and there, there are captioning services within YouTube, but it's not as precise as it should be for the standards that we need to meet. Um, so I just wanted to touch base with you to say uh, that staff are looking into options or would like would you like to have staff be directed to look into those options of possibly a third party company um, to figure out what costs are associated with that or really just our options moving forward. Any questions? Councilor Rowan? Yeah, no, I'd be in favor of looking at our options and, and assessing the costs. I mean, if the costs are exorbitant, then maybe we have to uh, end that service, which would be a real shame because it's going to decrease accessibility. But we 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 should look into uh, what our options are. Agree. Okay. Any further comments? We have a motion. Councillor Shaba and Councillor. Be it resolved that memorandum number 2021-CLK-002M entitled Website Accessibility be received and that staff be directed to investigate and report back to council third-party costs for video closed captioning services. All in favor? Motion carried. Item 7, consideration of notices of motion. None noted. Item number eight, introduction, reading, and consideration of bylaws. We have a few bylaws to go through here. So moved by Lad Shaba, seconded by Patrick Adams. Be it resolved that the following bylaw be ready first, second, and third time. Numbered pass, signed by the mayor and the clerk, and the seal of the corporation be affixed thereto. Bylaw number 21-001 being a bylaw to provide interim tax levy and to provide for the payment of taxes and to provide for penalty and interest of 1% per month. All in favor? Motion carried. Moved by Stacey White, seconded by Casey Owens. Be it resolved that the following bylaw be read a first, second, and third time numbered pass signed by the mayor and the clerk and the seal of the corporation be affixed thereto. Bylaw number 21-002 being a bylaw to set the municipal water and wastewater rates for 2021 prior to the adoption of a budget. All in favor? Motion carried. Moved by Eugene Ivanoff, seconded by Rick Owens. Be it resolved that the following bylaw be read a first, second, and third time. Numbered pass signed by the mayor and the clerk and the seal of the corporation be affixed there too. Bylaw number 21-003, being a bylaw to authorize the borrowing for current expenditures for 2021. All in favor? Motion carried. Moved by Casey Owen, seconded by Lad Shaba. Be it resolved that the following bylaw be read a first, second, and third time. Numbered pass signed by the mayor and the clerk and the seal of the corporation be affixed there too. Bylaw number 21-004, being a bylaw to authorize and execute the collective agreement between the Corporation of the Town of Kirkland Lake and QP Local 1074. All in favor? Motion carried. 
Moved by Stacy White, seconded by Patrick Adams, be it resolved that the following bylaw be read at first, second, and third time. Numbers passed, signed by the mayor and the clerk, and the seal of the corporation be affixed thereto. Bylaw number 21-005, being a bylaw to authorize the mayor and clerk to execute an agreement with Ontario Federation of Snowmobile Clubs. All in favor? Motion carried. And that's all of them. Okay. Item number nine, questions from council to staff. None noted. Item number 10, notice of motions. None noted. Councillor's report. Councillor update 11.1. Councillor Ivanov. I would uh, just like to, uh, on behalf of this council, um, the residents of Kirkland Lake and the students that are going to school, thank Kirkland Lake Gold publicly for their donation of $100,000 uh, to the uh, schools for the, their PPE equipment. Uh, a lot of schools are, have got equipment that uh, Kirkland Lake Gold funded through uh, a uh, initiative uh, that was started by Jeff Reynolds of the Prospectors Inn and, the, and Kirkland Lake Rotary Club. Uh, Kirkland Lake Gold did give them $100,000, and some of that money has gone to uh, uh, buy PPE equipment. It's stuff that wasn't funded by the board or by the government of, uh, of Ontario. And uh, I think uh, they should be commended for their donation. I know that they have uh, uh, have ordered and have delivered these HEPA filters, which are surgical-type filters that they put in surgical rooms uh, to put in classrooms. And uh, I, I know... Uh, Kirkland Lake Gold doesn't get enough credit for everything they do in our community, and I think they're a great corporate citizen. And I just want to publicly thank them. Thank you, Councillor Ivanov. Other councillors to report? None noted. We have a motion, Councillor Shaba and Councillor White. Be resolved that the verbal updates from members of council be received. All in favor? Motion carried. We have a motion to move into a in-camera session. Councillor Owens and Councillor White. All in favor? Okay. Oh, sorry. Read the motion. Be it resolved that council move into a closed session pursuant to section 239-2 to discuss one land disposition matter, one labor relations matter, and one matter that is subject to solicitor client privilege. All in favor? Motion carried. Nothing noted. Confirmation bylaw. Motion by Rick Owen. Second advice. Lachaba. Be it resolved that the following bylaw be read at first, second, and third time. Numbers passed, signed by the mayor and the clerk, and the seal of the corporation be affixed thereto. Bylaw number 21-006, being a bylaw to confirm the proceedings of council at its meeting held January 12, 2021. All in favor? Motion carried. Motion to adjourn. Councillor White. Second by Councillor Adams. Be it resolved that council adjourn the January 12th, 2021 regular meeting of council. All in favor? Motion carried. Meeting adjourned.